Hey there everybody, Joe here. Thanks for watching again. You can see that I've made a lot of progress, but it's, it's in great need of a lot of details. Now I pretty much always mess with the ripples in a, in a body of water after I paint it, after I get the general layout put together. I'll fine tune the, sh the shapes and look for the things that I like and don't like and, and try to fine tune those. But before I get myself into that, that detail commitment, I'm going to put the white water, the, the foam across the top because I don't want to waste time messing with the lighting on ripples that are just going to get covered by white water. So now down in here where I have these uh, ripples that I've started to work on a little bit, putting highlight colors in. Well, the method that I'm following is I'm brightening the color toward the middle of the established face of each little ripple. So I'm not just putting this brighter orange color anywhere. I'm specifically putting it right in the middle of the already more orange color because if you remember at the beginning when I laid this out I started with this more orange color that's down at the base and then I put these grayer darker reflection colors over that and kind of blended them together so to enhance that effect that I already have going I'm gonna put the brightness of maybe there's some rocks down there catching the sunlight and I'm gonna brighten those up I can even use black uh, let's let's do some real quick so right here to me this looks kind of funny and so I'll work on this area now this is a established reflection area where I started with my light grayish blue color and then after I put that on I put this more brownish gray you know whatever you want to call that color yellowish brownish gray inside of the lighter bluer color that I put on that all is on the reflection area that's on top of these faces. So I'm noticing that this I made large. I made that darker reflection area kind of large in comparison to these up here. So the pattern that I always want to be mindful of with water is that it's constantly, uh, it, it's always gradually changing as you go up or down in the picture. So, so every shape, every color gradually gets smaller or bigger or brighter or dimmer as you get higher or lower on the picture. These shapes, these darker reflection shapes, are getting smaller as they come closer to me because there's less and less area that's reflecting. And so suddenly I have a large one here. It's not that that can't happen, it's just that it's so out of place right now because of that sudden change. So what I'll do is make this area smaller and then it, it'll feel like it's more in line with what's happening in this picture. So why don't we go with what's already here. I'm going to make a the, the face of a wave right here. So red and yellow. This is the face of a wave. This is another face right here. I can see I painted one there too that's kind of dark. So I'll just brighten both of those up. I'll use all this yellow right here. And then I'll even... Uh, uh, I'll divide them up a little bit by putting some black. Watch, I'll, I'll make it like maybe there's a couple rocks in there and this is a shadow in between them. Let's do it in both of them. So I can do that by putting that black down and then gradually blending away from that black that I put in there. See how I did that? I, I left the black in the middle. Now I'm, I'm kind of rounding that shadow. The face of a wave is a magnifying glass. And so whatever's toward the middle kind of bubbles up. So to get that effect, I'll just round, round this shape and then I'll put a bright, a bright highlight in the middle of it. Watch me take the white and put the brightest area right there in the middle. Okay, now there's a lot about this stream that I really like, but there's also a lot that I don't. And this bright white with the, the slightly violet mix in the shadows did not do like I wanted it to. Uh, I meant for these, see how I did darker areas wherever I had reflection on the water, I used the darker bluer color on the foam. and I wanted it to look like it was going with the water and going down the back side of the wave, but it, it did the opposite. It actually looks like the dark areas are going up like the faces of the wave, so I, I was wrong about that, you know. it's. Uh, I, I, I just have to uh, 
just have to accept that I was wrong and redo it. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. I think it could be so much better if I rearrange the colors a little. So I'm going to go with a different strategy. And uh, this, this all, it came out, it looks like soapy water to me, you know, because the difference is so extreme. So this is something I imagine a little more on maybe a beach, you know, with, with all of the sea foam settling on the beach. This looks a little bit more like that, but, but I don't like it for this stream. So I'm going to make something more subtle, make the foam a little more colored like the water. And I'm going to try a little bit different strategy where I start with the bright underwater colors of the foam mixed with this brownish water. And then I'll use gray reflection over the top and then worry about the white foam on the surface last. So first is the underwater color and reflection. And the underwater color, just like in here, includes this bright, uh, this bright uh, brown, brown color, bright brown. That's a funny word, isn't it? Okay. So, to get started, I'm going to want to mix a light color here, underwater color. Now, I'm not going to redo this whole stream. I really like the way this came out. So, I'm not going to be redoing that or these ripples in here, just where I have this strange looking foam. And I do like this shadow that I threw in there. This is the shadow of the log up here, but uh, I, I want to keep this bright white that's back in here. So. I won't, I won't bother redoing that. Look, I got distracted. I started talking about it and then I had to touch it. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll keep my shadow and redo everything from here to here. Just this. So this I want to be, this is where, where, where the foam is starting to disperse. It's starting to disappear a little. So it's going to start turning into my, my brown water. But it's still bright because there's a lot of foam under the water. So I'll mix my orange in here, just my red and yellow. Now, now I could use a, a, like a cadmium orange, or, or the, you you wouldn't call it that. You know, they they don't just sell cadmium orange in in a gallon cans like this uh, where I get my paint. But I could use paint that's tinted with an orange tint. That would be a lot brighter if I needed a bright orange. But with with the Landscapes, I just never really need that bright of an orange, so red and yellow always seem to suffice. Perhaps one day I will want that bright primary orange. When a color is brighter than what I can mix, regardless of what color it is, I just call it primary. If I can't mix it, I just call it primary. So I have primary green, primary orange, primary violet, any of those. Okay, so see how I'm keeping it real bright up in here. I'll add a little more white even right here. So this is going to be my, my real bright underwater color. And then it's getting darker and my mix is going to become more red. Maybe not visually more red, but it's going to have more red in it as I move away from the brighter color. Now the reason I'm keeping it brighter up there, like I said, is because there's just foam mixed in with the water. Like this. See, now this is similar to my underwater color down in here. That's what I want. I just want my brighter color just to be up there at the top where that waterfall is happening. Now in here we've got a shadow. Let's grab a little water. I guess I'm going to end up redoing that shadow of that log because the these colors definitely don't match. That greenish hue is okay. That looks natural. Looks like a creek that has some algae in it. Okay, so now before I get too far, while this is still a little bit wet, I might get a softer look if I do the reflection while that base is, is still not all the way dry. Here in Arizona, paint dries really quick. 
typically. We do have some humid days once in a long while. Okay, so this is my reflection and it's just black and white. That's all it is. I'm doing just like I did the first time. Slightly sloping the the strokes down to the left so that the water looks like it's in motion. Then I'll do the same thing and make some also slightly sloping down to the right. I think I will redo this shadow because I don't want to try to have to think of a way to make that that blend. So I'm just going to go from the beginning again and continue my gradient that goes from the 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 pure white to the slightly brownish white here. Now I'm going to redo my little splashes at the base of the waterfall. And the idea here is that I shadow my splashes. So just like I'm painting a puffy cloud and, I, and these white parts are the tips that are splashing out the furthest that have the most light on them. But the color I use for the shadow is a combination of the underwater color that it's splashing out of, but also my, my uh, blue violet white water shadow color because it has that white water in it. This is, this water is, is getting splashed around a lot. So it has a whole lot of those little bubbles. So the underwater color gets washed out and mixed with the shadow color of the white water. So it's a combination. And then that should make my splashes look real natural. So I think I can do better than what's on there right now. Okay, now I'm ready to do the foam on the top and I'll probably do less of it and I'm just going to stick with black and white to get that uh, bluish gray mix because black and white all by itself next to next to this orange brown color already has a little bit of a blue violet hue to it and I think that'll be enough after seeing what it looked like when I <laughs> when I added the blue and red. So here we go. Okay just a couple more bright little highlights in here because I feel like I kind of lost the edge of my shadow. So I'll just do a couple more little horizontal lines just to brighten up this, this one spot. I really want to stay away from any little dab, you know, of vertical shapes because it just has such an effect on the perspective. Just one little dab of the brush makes a shape that, that doesn't look flattened out. And it just has such an effect, you know, you wouldn't think it would matter that much, but it does. I'm just putting a little bit more of that white in this one area, just so I have that, that shadow coming across. So now I want to come through and define this shadow again. And I'm pretty much just going to do it with this darkest reflection color and blend that in to the rest of the water and then call this good. So I'll, I'll put my darkest color right through the middle where I want my deepest crevice to be. And let's just put black in there. And then I'll blend the rock out from that dark stripe and then I'll blend the water out from that dark stripe. So we have a very similar color for both of them. So let's put an orange kind of a color here. And when that hits that black, it's gonna turn brown. Let's put the red down in the black. That's my rock. I got more red than yellow in there. I need to, need to add yellow. Okay. Put some yellow up high here. So as I continue to just work that into the black, it's all going to become one brownish color. And I can use that color down here on the water too and I'll just be sure that I don't pull it too far out, you know, into the nice water that I already did, but try to stick with my reflection areas. Just make a nice shadow there. I might need to add a little bit of, of white. We'll see. Oh, there's already some white in there. Let's grab more of this. 
See, and I leave that darkest area right in the middle of that divide. Let's get that gray evened out. Okay, this color's starting to blend in. Got some nice shadows under that rock. That's kind of fun because it looks like there's light bouncing off the water hitting the rock. I can take a tiny bit of white and go like this. Okay, the next thing I want to do is get this part of my stream figured out. So same thing right here on the face of it. That's going to be my, my bright underwater color. So all that yellow and black and maybe we'll see if I want to add a little bit of red. And then, you know, it'll be a little bit darker where it slopes down here just before the, the white water. And then it'll be a little bit darker also up here on top. See, this is how you do this bend in the water. It's dark, darker, wherever it bends away from the angle you're looking at it from. So here's where you see all the color, right there on the face. And then the white happens right under that. And this is where, you know, there might be, might be water shooting out, leaving air space behind it. Now up here, I wanna blend my reflection colors into this this dark shadow color here I want to gradually turn it into my reflection color so I'll add some black and white right there but now that I have my forest up there above this water I'm, I'm gonna put reflection in here so I want maybe the tiniest bit of black to turn this yellow a little green so that I'm getting these colors here and then I'm just gonna redo this in a slightly darker version Okay, let's take a look at some of the comments from last week, and that was the video that I edited myself. So, uh, right away, Daniela says, I really like this editing style with the voiceover and time lapse. Thank you very much, Daniela. And um, it took me an entire day to do what my brother Ben does in an hour. So, I definitely will not be doing that very frequently, but it did feel good to uh, refresh my, my uh, abilities to produce a video on my own. I feel like uh, I'm, I'm still validated as a video editor like I did in the old days. Matt Nicholson is getting back to me on what is a tonalist. And so uh, he says, tonalists care more about correct values and color. Colorists care more about color and won't use black. Max says that the, the problem with the colorist method, I'm paraphrasing, it is substituting black with burnt umber. Umber pigment is just dirt and burnt umber is burnt dirt. Now, I did not know that. That's interesting to me. So thank you for that information. So I just feel I have more control over my values since I use a limited palette. Red, yellow, blue, black, white. I can mix burnt umber with those colors, but I can't get a true black with just primaries. If that makes sense. Yes, it does. I relate very much. So this, this is a good point that Mac brings up. You can mix a brown, as you've seen me do here, but every pigment definitely has its place. And so those brown pigments, burnt umber, raw umber, umber, however you, however you call it, uh, I can't mix a brown in, in a, um, I think Mac mentions this too, I can't mix a brown that's just like that umber. I can mix something close. So when I need my richest brown, I, I might go to an, an umber pigment. But uh, I definitely think having access to the darkest black is is the most valuable thing so so i definitely always use black and then i can i can make the illusion of more color than there actually is by putting a brighter color than i would have and just putting black in the middle of it you know so so that it kind of has a colored halo around it thanks for the information mac on the browns and i'm glad to hear that you value the use of black i found it to be very helpful and my work as well. Jay Sullivan says, transitionary color? I think you mean local color. Either that or mid-tone. It goes on to say, I'm still wondering if your murals have been cracking because of water breaking the binding agent in the paint. Okay, these are good points that uh, you bring up, Jay. And, and I have talked in the past in other videos about uh, using a middle color and I, I remember struggling with what to call it. Well, should I call this the true color or should I call it 
the local color. I remember there was a lot of suggestions or and uh, I, there were some other good suggestions. I said, well, I, in the end, I decided I'm going to call it the object color because I like to, and a good example is, is when I do something like this log, where I have the object color I've decided is this brown. And then I'm going to add shadow to that to the object's color. I'm going to add black to the object's color to get the shadow. I'm going to add white to the object's color to get the highlight. And, and if you go back to the early, early episodes of this project, that's, that's what I did. I worked from that middle color. So then you could, you could also fairly say mid-tone. I like to call it an object color. When, when using it in that, in that uh, setting. So this is why I choose transitionary color. This is where I, I um, draw a difference. Now, the same thing could be said for this pine tree. So you could, you could fairly argue that I should call that this, the same thing, call it the object color that other artists would probably call a mid-tone. But I, I just like calling it the object color. Transitionary color specifically addresses this problem, that when you're modeling what light would do when it combines, when you're painting the natural world, you're simulating light striking many objects and combining mixing different colors and since light does not do what paint does to make a particular mix that goes from one light to another light color and they're mixing in the middle well if it was just light and we were just mixing light you don't need a color in that middle the mix is it that is the middle color but with paint i have to use a transitionary color to bring this color into this color without it making a wrong color in the middle. So it's specifically for transitioning from one color to another color, not specifically for representing the actual color of the object. So that's the difference that, that I would want to define between saying transitionary color versus an object color. When I paint a cloud, I will use red and add a little bit of red to the color that I put in between the cloud's shadow and the bright white. Now, the color of the cloud is nowhere close to red. Red is my transitionary color, and the truth is, I add that red to, to a mix of the white and, and my blue violet that I use for the shadow, so I have this very uh, kind of red violet that I use for a transitionary color on a cloud. It's a real normal looking cloud, doesn't look like a red cloud, but that little bit of transitionary color helps me with it. So maybe, I, I shouldn't specifically call the color on that pine tree transitionary, but there is value in defining the difference. And I remember uh, Jay uh, mentioning this before about the paint uh, possibly cracking from a lot of water being added. So I don't actually add a lot of water to the paint. I think that because I add the water to the surface after I apply the paint, that makes a difference too. So, so the paint gets a good bond on the wall and then I put water over the surface and that water is drying really quickly while I'm blending. So the paint gets thicker and thicker while I'm still blending it. So it's not the same as doing like a 50-50 mix of paint and water and then just putting that on the wall. I, I do think that that would definitely compromise the integrity of the paint. But when I add water to my paint directly and then apply it to the wall, it's like, you know, 5-10%. Uh, it's, a, it's a small amount. A little bit of water is all it takes to significantly thin the viscosity of the paint. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing up those valuable uh, points, Jay. Luke Mitchell says, in a big piece like this, I love to see little hidden details that maybe nobody else has. I think your daughter might like that too. How about... The little ladybug nestled away. <laughs> thanks for the continued lesson from Bermuda. Thanks for the shout out from Bermuda. You know what's funny about this is that I was painting a, a mural at my, my uh, best friend Todd's house for his son Cooper. And you can look at that online. It's like a, a hobbit house. It's a, it's a mural of a little tree over a hobbit house. Real simple. And so Todd asks his son Cooper, he says, what do you want to put in the mural? You, let's, let's put something special in it. You can decide what he paints. He says, I want 
a ladybug in a tree reading a book. That's what he said. He's like, I don't know, he must have been five years old, just a, just a little guy. And that's what he wanted. So I painted that exact thing. And that ladybug in the tree reading the book is about as big as this fingernail right here. And so, uh, you know, I should do a, a zoomed in photo of that one of these days. I never did post it anywhere, but, but anybody that sees that in person, they can see the tiny ladybug reading a book. Eric Killius says, what kind of brushes are you using? So I use mostly Purdy brand paint brushes. Do I have any laying around here? And they're the same brushes that, that many paint contractors use to cut in walls. You, you know, they, they get a nice clean edge. I like brushes that give me a nice sharp edge when I paint a line. So I always use synthetic bristles. Now these down here on the floor, I used to buy more expensive brushes, but I burned through them just as fast as these super cheap brushes. And I noticed that the uh, bristles performed just as well. So this brush, it was just a couple of bucks and it has synthetic bristles. These are not natural hair bristles. And you can see that it has an angled cut. I don't always use one that has an angled cut. I, I use them with a square cut a lot of the time, but they, they just about always have this, you know, they're, they're skinny this way, wide this way, and I can cut a really sharp line. That's how I do a lot of my water reflection is going this way. When those bristles are wet, they, they really taper to a sharp point and I can do very tiny details like the little splashes of white water and little grass blades and reflection. I, I mean, whatever. But this is the only brush that I've found does a good and quick job of those kinds of details. So this is really just a miniature version of your typical purdy contractor style paintbrush. Nylon polyester bristles is what those big ones are made of. I don't, I don't know what this is made of. Probably something similar. Linda Nelson uh, leaves a very nice compliment after she says thank you for, for all of the jibber jabber and saying, uh, the, the agreeing with the value of inventing the tool that you need. She says, please consider doing more voiceover videos, Joe, and most importantly, jabber on, my friend. These are golden nuggets you are sharing. God bless you and your generosity, Joe. Well, thank you very much for the flattering compliment, and it's always a huge thrill for me to hear that my research is is uh, benefiting somebody besides myself, besides this one painting. As I've said before, I get a bigger thrill out of knowing that something that I've found can be helpful to many other people than I do out of having people admire my, my painting. I was never able to complete a painting, believe it or not, before I started making how-to videos. Well, actually, you know, when I started doing murals for a living, I started completing paintings. But uh, I guess I should say that I was never so excited about the paintings as when I started uh, wanting to make instructional content. Because then I became a researcher and I was researching what I love to study. And, and so this is how I love to spend my time is figuring out, well, why is that? I mean, I, I see that that's working or I see that that's not working, but why? I gotta know why so that I can do this later. And the thrill of just finding that answer is so much more valuable than whether or not I use that answer very well in a painting and make a nice painting. Uh, I don't feel like I have that many great paintings. Every painting I see, I'm like, oh, it definitely could be better, but uh, oh well, I wanna move on. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for the nice compliment. Denise Butler says, this foam tool reminded me of making potato stencils for my kids. I've done that too. That is fun. I like that. And, and uh, you know, uh, maybe a potato would have worked for this. Maybe that would be a, a, a good alternative. Marilyn Nicholas says, you should get a patent for this tool before anyone else does. Amazing painting. Thank you very much for that nice compliment. I learned this in, in, uh, in researching whether or not to get patents on different ideas I invented. Once something is public, you cannot patent it. So 
now that you've seen it on this video, you're free to use it. And it's not like you didn't know you're free to use it. Nobody's ever going to stop you from cutting a piece of foam. But if something's public, then it, it doesn't get patented. And so I like that because now I know that I can post things that I invent without worrying about somebody else taking it and not allowing me to use it later. I didn't know that before I looked into it, but, but that's kind of a cool thing. Once something is on a public platform, it can't be patented. Linzer Tube says, hope your Thanksgiving was great, Joe. Well, thank you very much, Linzer Tube. I hope your Thanksgiving was great also. I did have a great Thanksgiving. My wife's family came in from Texas and down from Prescott Valley. Uh, up from Prescott Valley, that's that's south of us here. And we had a good old time. It's been a while since that family got together. Autumn Martino says, why not try a paint marker in green with a fine tip and draw little lines all over the, uh, the tree area? Maybe that would work great, but I need speed. So that was the purpose of the foam is, you know, to get 10 needles at a time with one motion. Because in doing a big wall, you know, the, the time really adds up if I have to do one at a time little needles. But thank you for that comment, Autumn, and for watching my video. I really appreciate that. Feliz Splash says, I am from Colombia, South America. Well, thank you for tuning in all the way from Colombia, South America. My English isn't very good, but I understand everything you say. Complex things. I'm so happy. Thank you very much. God bless you. Well, Thank you very much for, for that very encouraging feedback, Felice. I hope you continue to watch and, and uh, get, get some good value out of my videos. It's always very, very uh, encouraging for me to hear that. Mitchell Wright just wanted to be the first to comment, so <laughs> congratulations. All right, well, I'm gonna stop there for today. Now, next week is going to be the final video on this project. So I'm going to time lapse through a whole bunch of tiny tedious details and of course I'm also saving them in real time for later use and I'm going to look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you again for watching and all of the good comments. I'll see you next time.